Hey, welcome to Fountain City Church's weekly sermon. Our mission is to multiply families of missional disciples, both locally and globally. And we pray that this sermon impacts you to do just that. If you live in the Chattahoochee Valley area, come and worship with us on a Sunday. Thanks. Listen to what Tyler Staten writes about it. He says the resurrection is actually Jesus' most offensive act. A bodily resurrection means that Jesus isn't a likable revolutionary, and he can't be. Kurt Cobain, Will Hunting, Gandhi, Mandela, MLK, none of those men walked out of their graves. An actual resurrected Jesus does not make him a great man, it makes him Lord. It means he flooded the recurring darkness with constant light, overcame systemic evil, swallowed up personal failure and defeated death. The parts of life so painful that the best we can do is change the subject Jesus cut away through. And if Jesus really rose, we fall on our knees and worship or we stand up in offense because it means that he is either Lord or that he thinks he is. And that's dangerous. If Jesus really rose, he's more than a great man. He's much more. He is Lord and God. And I would add this morning that uh, the resurrected Jesus is not someone that we can leverage for our own gain or quote when it's convenient, but just kind of discard the other times. He's not an inspiring teacher who has simply died and stayed buried. If he was, we could take him and leave him on our own terms. But a resurrected king, that means that we're following a living person with an actual desire to engage with us, even in our frustrations and doubts about him. Now, my goal today is really simple. I want us to fight for a culture of honesty and transparency um, in the way that we wrestle out faith and following Jesus. Many of you, many of us have been in the church for decades, but we still kind of come into church on a Sunday morning and we just armor up with the right answers, right? Got to put on the right face. Got to get it all straightened out so that people don't ask me too many questions about how I'm doing, so that people don't actually get up under the surface of what's going on in my life. I just got to armor up and make sure that I clean it up enough in front of everybody. I give pat answers and I play the part and hear me. We do it for good reason. We don't historically do a good job of dealing with the truth when people tell us. Like, I had this college professor one time. I was in the bathroom of all places, and I was like, Dr. Cotton, how are you? And he goes, I am terrible. And I was like, I was not ready. (laughs) (laughs) That is not urinal conversation. You know what I mean? Like, if y'all don't know, there's a very specific protocol at urinals, ladies. It's a whole different world in there. Okay? (laughs) You do not. It is very different. And Dr. Cotton shot me really straight, and I wasn't, on, I wasn't ready for his honesty. What would it be like if the way that you identified the church was that's the place where I can be the most honest? Like when I walk in, when I'm with people who are honestly pursuing Jesus, I can be raw and vulnerable about what's actually going on in my life and my faith, and I don't have to hide, and I don't have to cover, and I don't have to armor up. And that we would be the kind of people who know what to do with that. Not only that we would know how to do that ourselves, but we would know what to do with it. Let me ask you a question. Is that your experience? It's not mine. Either in giving the truth or in being able to respond and receive it. That is precisely what we want to press into. Many of us, we have lived kind of hiding inside the walls of the church, just like we have every other place. But what I believe that God is inviting us into is to be a people of genuine pursuit and honest questions who really encounter the living Jesus. Resurrection means you can stop pretending. You can actually stop pretending and you can really pursue him with all your honest questions and you can genuinely encounter him. See, that's real life. People are asking real questions. You are here this morning asking real questions. Whether you're not, you're doing it with your mouth. You're doing it in your heart. And we believe that God meets people who are genuinely searching for him. Jesus isn't interested in pretense. He's not interested in our pretending. He actually loves to meet us right where we are. And and if Jesus isn't interested in pretense, then I don't think the church can be either. 
He comes to us in our real questions and doubts and our actual failures. He chooses to make himself known to those who are daring enough to seek him in spite of those things. And so we, like here this morning, part of the larger church, global church and local church, but we at Fountain City, we want to make sure that this is a place where you can genuinely genuinely wrestle with your actual lives and you can fight for each other to discover the living Christ in the middle of that. And that's really good news. And so can I just invite you, um, if, if you're really seeking him, this place is safe. And if you've come in because you have been culturally um, curated to armor up and to play pretend on Sundays, I get it. I am one of you. Can I encourage you to, like me, stop hiding and step into the light? Because the scriptures tell us that when we walk in the light as he's in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of his son Jesus purifies us. That tells me that if, if I play hide and seek at church, that I actually don't really have any fellowship with you and I can't live pure. Y'all feel that? So, so can we just do that as a, as a community? And let me just say, um, as Grant, lead pastor, I get to make this call. This is who we are. This is like, this is what we want to do. Um, and so over the next few weeks, I just want us to look at a few people and situations and how their encounters with Christ shape the way that we see ourselves um, and Him in light of resurrection. Uh, and I want to spend our time today looking at our most favorite apostle, Thomas. So uh, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20, verse 19. John 20, 19. Everybody good? Um, I have really felt like what I was feeling this morning in worship and what I feel uh, right now, what I felt in preparation was that the Lord was really slowing things way down and actually um, having honest conversation with us. And, And again, I think there's this thing in us where we are hardwired to hit these crescendos, particularly because we're charismatic and we're spirit filled um, and Easter, we've, we've got these crescendos. I feel like I've got to live on this high and it is, it is really disappointing when you can't, when you figure out that you can't actually live there. You know what I'm talking about? I got to go from encounter to encounter to encounter and we believe in encounters. I'm going to talk about them, but I'm just telling you that Jesus walks his three disciples off of the Mount of Transfiguration where they see him as he is in eternity And he walks them down into the demon-possessed valley to do life. And they have to figure out, what does it mean to trust him down here when I saw him up there? I saw him glorified. Now what? Now what down here? Right? And that's exactly where we find these guys. John chapter 20, verse 19. Shout at me when you're there. Just say, I'm there. Okay. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together... With the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, or the twin, some scholars say this is because Thomas looked so much like Jesus, they nicknamed him twin. Interesting. One of the twelve, he wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas gets a really bad reputation from this one moment. We name the guy off of his very worst moment. How do you like that? 
But I think if we're honest, Thomas is much more like us than we care to admit. Thomas' issue isn't a lack of love for Jesus. It's doubt that's rooted in disappointment. It's just hardened, calcified doubt that came because he believed so much. We often talk about Thomas as though he's this calculated, chronically doubtful person. But I think what we find in Thomas is someone who so deeply believed in Jesus that when things actually went south and Jesus died, he moved to this kind of hardened realism that struggled to hope anymore. Have you ever been there? When you believe so firmly, so deeply in something that, that when it didn't go the way that you thought, you just couldn't possibly bear to still hope. Thomas had gone all in on Jesus. He's one of 12 guys who left everything to follow him. We, we say that like it's a normal thing, but can you just imagine if Jesus walked in this morning, Fofo, and said, come, follow me. Come. Leave your families and your job that you've trained for. Leave the degree that you worked so hard for. Leave the culture that you know and the language that you speak and a dependable income and stable home environment and physically follow me and take on my way of living and my way of thinking. It is going to be altogether different than anything you've ever experienced. And Thomas, the one that we conveniently call doubter, said, yes. Yes, I'm in. The cost is everything, but the reward is you, Jesus. I'm in. I will follow you at all costs. Why? Because Thomas believed. The only reason Thomas doubted so voraciously was that he had believed so completely. In John 11, 16, we see what Thomas' faith in Jesus was really like. Jesus is talking about going back to Bethany because of Lazarus' death. But his buddies are terrified because the Jews had been threatening to stone Jesus. And in this moment, Thomas realizes that Jesus is resolute regardless of what it may cost him. He's going back to see his friend Lazarus and to see him raised from the dead. And Thomas' response gives us kind of a little insight into his heart for the Lord. He says, let's go with him so that we can also die with him. Is that the voice of a doubter? Those aren't the words of cold and calculated doubt. Those are the words of someone who loves Jesus with everything, who's committed to the Lord at all costs. In another place, in John 14, Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going to leave them. And even though they're kind of ignorant and they can't figure out what is he actually talking about, Jesus is working to comfort their hearts. And he says to them in verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? But if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that, I, that you may also be where I am. You know the place to where I'm going. And Thomas turns to him and he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Do you hear it? Even in his ignorance, Thomas doesn't want to be away from Jesus. Lord, tell us the way to get to you. Don't tell me you're leaving. Don't tell me I'm not going to feel your presence. Don't tell me I can't hear your words anymore. I have to know how to find you. How can we know the way if we don't know where you're going? Thomas isn't an apathetic doubter. Thomas is a diehard believer. Have you ever been around someone like him? Maybe in a season of life when you look back and you say, I just wish I could get back to that place when I had that kind of faith in Jesus. So how did this guy who left everything and who was willing to die with Jesus become known as the doubter? I don't, I'm not going to apologize for my tenderness this morning, but I feel like some of you, this is where you're at. Um, and I have felt in moments... Like, like my faith was gutted and I knew that he was real. I just didn't know what that meant for me anymore. And I really believe some of you are standing in that place this morning and I feel the weight of that. So forgive me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be weepy the whole time, okay? And talk like a turtle or something. <clears throat> How did this guy who left everything and who was willing to die with Jesus become the doubter? Disappointment. 
disappointment. The thing that he thought was going to happen didn't happen. Or it didn't happen the way that he thought it was going to. And when we look back at verse 24, this kind of says it all to me. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Have you guys ever stopped as you're reading the text at that moment and just asked, why? Why? Why is, Jesus, is Thomas not with the rest of the brothers after the greatest heartbreak of their lives? Why in the moment when they are pulling together, they're circling the wagons, they're unifying their hearts because they have been devastated, why is Thomas not there? Why is Thomas hiding? Now, there's no way to prove it, but I believe he was doing what so many of us do when we face real heartache and disappointment. He gave up and he wanted to be alone. He was hiding. He didn't want to be with people. He didn't want to look at any one of them in the eyes. He didn't want to talk about what happened. He was too devastated. Because the thing that he believed so deeply from his guts went south and he couldn't bear to keep walking in the same direction. He wanted to be alone. Why meet with the disciples of Jesus if there's no Jesus? Go ahead, fellas. Have fun playing pretend. I put all my eggs in that basket. Look where it's got me. I got nothing to show for it. I'm through. I'm not going to play games with you guys. I'm not going to get together in some side room and talk about the good old days. I'm done. You ever felt like that? Friends, that is the real trouble with faith and hope is it runs the risk of real disappointment. If you only moderately believe and you're let down, the fall isn't too bad. No big deal, right? You just go back to what you were doing before. You pretend it's no big deal. It wasn't a big issue. That's the theme of our generation. If you have low expectations, you don't get let down. Right? And so we believe little and we commit little in hopes that we won't get hurt. But faith is the substance of hope. It's the substance of hope. It's the tangible thing I can touch based on what I believe so deeply that it changes the way that I live. Faith means that I hope in, in something so much that, I, that I'm willing to burn the ships, that I turn my back on everything else in order to go after this one thing. That's an old military saying when they would take new territories where they had to take ships to get there. If you want to succeed in this conquest, burn the ships. In other words, there's no turning back. Faith is that I hope so deeply that there is no turning back. No matter what questions come, no matter what obstacles I'll face, no matter what realities or doubts or disillusionments or disappointments, because he is true, I will put everything in that one direction. It means that we go all in, that we fully build our lives on the assumption that Jesus is reliable and that everything he said about life and sin and eternity is true. Even those ideas that are contested by everything and everyone around us, even by our own feelings. And if we give up hope out of fear of disappointment, we forfeit faith. And without faith, we can't please God. So if, I, if, if my disappointment trumps my hope, then my hope cripples my capacity to have belief in faith. Do you see the slippery slope of disappointment? We kind of treat it like a kitten, but it's a tiger. And we have to be very present of mind and heart that when things don't go the way that we thought that they should, that it has the capacity, it has the power to undermine my capacity to hold on to hope. Hope that I will build my life on who he is and what he said. Disappointment hardens that tender, hopeful faith into a cold, rigid realism. Or worse yet, we just become half-hearted. You know what I'm talking about? We, we just never really commit. We keep our options open in case things don't work out. We just go half in. And there's a very real difference in following Jesus half-heartedly and then giving him everything. And it's not because everything's based on our works. It's just I know the difference of whether or not Cody's all in or not. Right? Floor stomping Cody. I know the difference. I know the difference if Grant Collins is all in or not. I know the difference, and you know the difference about you. Many of us live there right now. Things were a lot simpler before you lost that person or that thing. Belief came more simply, more naturally. 
You prayed for something and it didn't happen. You, you hoped for healing and your loved one still passed. You did the right thing and you still got hurt. And, and maybe if we're honest enough this morning, if we can strip off enough of the layers this morning, you still believe, but it's kind of cold and indifferent. And it feels more like duty than love. It's like that job that you started and you deeply enjoyed it and then it just became work and you despised it, but you still did it just because it paid the bills. For some of you, you're in a relationship with Jesus because it pays the bills, because your heart has been disappointed and feels the sting of loss. You're like Thomas, you know too much. Friends, Jesus' resurrection doesn't skip over that place in us. Jesus' resurrection doesn't bypass your pain or your questions or your doubts. It confronts them head on. His resurrection takes on hopelessness head on. It means that the disappointment you face is not the final word. Now think about that. The death of your loved one, that lost hope, that lost dream, that's not the defining moment of their life or of yours any longer. And one day, despite all the odds, the resurrection of Jesus declares that all things will be made new and restored. Folks, the invitation that we feel in our disappointment isn't better theology. It's not more understanding about God. It's not even some calculated realism. It is an encounter with God. The invitation to disappointment and doubt, to frustration and failure isn't, I just need to know more about him. It's him in the body. It's Jesus himself. And for many of you, you're trying to like strain your brain to make sure I can get enough wisdom out of the bad stuff I've endured so that I can somehow put up with this God who is alive but distant. And Jesus says, I'm here in the body. I actually want to come and touch you and I want to allow you to touch me. I want for this resurrection thing to go past rah-rah Sunday morning on Easter into a daily lifestyle of you having access to the body in the throne room of God. It's an encounter that he invites us into. The disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Imagine them telling what had happened. He came to us, Thomas. And Thomas all the while, no, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Too many times, I've heard this too many times. I don't care. I don't want to hear you guys. Thomas, we're telling you, he came. He came. And and he showed us his hands. And he showed us his side. And he breathed on us, Thomas. Now that note is really important because what we see in Thomas as doubt is something that is so much deeper. I think it's the flicker of hope being personalized. He's saying, I, I'm not going to hear it from you. Right? Listen to his response. Good for you guys. Good for you. But I just cannot believe based on your experience, I got to know it for myself. And and some of you may be there this morning, teetering on this place of a faith that has received from others. And you're saying, you know what? Not good enough anymore. I actually need to experience the Lord for myself. Because the thing that I'm enduring right now, it demands presence and it demands an encounter with the living God. Not just lip service and words on a page. Tangible presence of God. He says, it's not good enough anymore. Unless I see the nail marks in, my, in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. What do you hear? Man, he is hurt. Unless I see it, I'm not going to hope anymore. Now, this is an honest kind of disruptive prayer that just won't settle. And, and, and while I really believe Jesus says, hey, Thomas, if you could have believed without seeing, that would have been better. He also says, come and touch me. Come and see. Exactly what you're looking for is here. This is the kind of prayer that I believe God wants us to lean into. God, I see what you did for Daniel, Lord. I know what you've done for Caleb. Father, I know what you've done for Carla. Lord, I know what it is that you're up to in Corey's life. But but if I don't experience it, if it's not real for me, I'm done. I can't make it. I, I don't know if you've gotten there. I don't know if you have stepped off the edge of that kind of platform of honesty with the Lord where you say, that is good for them. But if I don't feel you, who cares? Are you, are you guys with me? Okay. I remember standing in the backyard of my house outside of Evangel 
um, when we were supposed to go to Turkey and that got flipped on its head. And I had relationships in my life that were deeply important to me that were completely south, like radio silence for a year. And I felt, y'all, like, like God had turned his back on me. And he had it. He had not I just remember marching around that yard going, if this is it, I'm out. Like, if, if, if this is what it looks like. And feeling his tenderness and his closeness in a way that I can't tell you. In a season where I learned how to tell the truth, finally. And feeling like the God of all creation, who I thought would stiff arm me out of being all too familiar with him, brought me close. And I had the distinct impression that for many of us, we have stayed on the outside of this religious kind of relationship where we don't actually say what's going on in our hearts and we never can fully pursue the Lord because we dare not hope out of fear of disappointment, out of fear of failure, out of fear of actually how broken we are. I'm not going to make it, Lord. That's my, my, my thought, is if I'm God in the flesh and I hear Thomas say that, what do I think I would say back to him? You miserable loser. How dare you turn your faithlessness toward me in this moment? Have I not proved? Now this is a really important moment because it tells us a lot about who God actually is. Who do you think he actually is? In your moment of desperation and despair, in your moment of doubt, what is God like? Verse 26 tells us, a week later, when his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with him, pause, I think it's interesting that Jesus has only 40 days in his resurrected body on the earth, and he spends seven of them letting Thomas stew. Have you thought about that? That's a large amount of time to let Thomas sit in this reality, this longing to see him. That what was hardened in doubt, I think, had just gotten like this ember that was warming and gotten soft and tender again. And just saying, I just want to know you. You know what I'm talking about? You get in a fight with your spouse or you're, you're too close to something and your heart is devastated and it's too hard and cold and edgy. And then you give it a little time and you go, I, that's just pain. The truth is, I just want to be near you. I think that's where we're at right here. How, how often do we think that all the loose ends ought to tie up really quickly and we miss out on God's patience and his steadfast love toward us, even when our hearts are stiff, right? Moving on in verse 26. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. Now, pause. You guys have probably read this as much as I have, which means you're just phoning it in right now. It's normal. Remember what Thomas has said. Remember that he's been sitting for a week Saying, I just want to, I want to see him. I need to know him. I need to experience his love again. I need to know that this is true. I can't just count on other people's words. And then Jesus comes in the room. Can you imagine his face? Can you imagine all the indifference and hard exterior melt into tender sobs at the sight of his Lord? All that he had longed for. All that he cried out for. All of that unbelief and stiffness folded at the sight of Jesus. And then Jesus looks at Thomas. He comes into the room and he looks directly at Thomas. <laughs> Can you imagine being one of the other disciples? Like, yes, you know, everything this guy has been crying out for, everything he's been praying for, it's real. And here he is. Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. Not Lord, God, my Lord, my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, because you've believed, uh, or because you have seen me, you've believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, God doesn't stiff arm you in your doubts and disappointments. He invites us into an encounter with the living Christ. Resurrection is not rah-rah minus reality. Resurrection is an, a confrontation with reality. It is the real God meeting you in your real life with the reality of resurrection. It doesn't just preach good on Sunday. It lives with you every single day of the week. 
And so if you have doubts, you're welcome. If you have disappointments, you are welcome. But don't park the car. Right? right. right? Drive towards Jesus who is alive. Move towards the living God who invites you into an encounter with Him. He says it. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. There's a famous Caravaggio painting that's going to be on the screen behind us. This is the depiction that people in the early church um, would have thought of. What would it be like to be in that moment? And for the Lord to invite you to touch him. I find it so compelling that Jesus has him put his hand into his side. Genesis tells us that Eve was formed out of the side of Adam. It's Jesus' way of saying the same way that a bride was formed for Adam out of his side. I was open. You can touch it. And it's from this place that you belong to me forever. It's from the price that I paid. Now put your hand there. You feel that? You're mine forever. You thought you lost. You thought it was over. You thought the disappointment was too much and you couldn't hope again. And here I am. Isaiah 53 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. And notice that he has Thomas touch him. Touch him. He wouldn't let Mary touch him. I don't know if you remember those gospels. He says, don't hold on to me. I haven't ascended to be with the Father yet. But in this moment, he says, Thomas, put your hands on me. This is not just hope for one day. It's for today. This is tangible. This is resurrection in the material world. This is the realities of heaven stepping into the broken reality of your Monday or your marriage or whatever. Real Jesus with real flesh, touch me. Feel this. Jesus doesn't reject us in our honest questions and doubts. He invites us to encounter. He invites you to encounter Him. Are are you in despair? Is your heart doubting and disillusioned? Do you feel like what was once warm and tender is now metal and clanking? God says, come, encounter me. Come and touch me. Put your hands on me. Feel the place where I paid for your sin. Investigate the moment of loss and realize that I have triumphed and I am really with you. Not just hope for one day, but it begins today. You can trust me. Church history tells us about Thomas that he actually went further than any other disciple in sharing the good news. That he went to India. He was in North and South India. And that he actually died at the hands of someone who took a spear and thrust it through him. I wonder if in that moment, I can't help but my imagination to see that Thomas is imagining Jesus thrust through as the very spear touches him. And that moment when he says, put your hand there. Lord, I'll pay it. I'll do that thing. You did it. I want to be where you are. No doubting man would lay down his life without experiencing something that was worth giving it all for. Something that lay beyond death. Something better. And if you're here today and your heart is hard or apathetic, For many of you, you have lost loved ones and relationships have gone sideways and stuff is hard right now. And I just want you to hear that the story of resurrection doesn't end with a worship service around the cross. It ends with people who are in doubt and dismay and Jesus showing up in their real lives to prove that he is in fact who he says he is and he meant what he said. He meant it. And he meant it for you. And if you would turn that hard-hearted apathy into a warm-hearted pursuit that you will find him. You will find him. So hear the invitation of Jesus this morning. Touch me. See my hands. Put your hand here in my side. He's not afraid of genuine pursuit. He promises that he will show up. And he will respond when you seek him. Will you stand to your feet? I literally, I just want to make a space for us to just wait on the Lord and pursue him. For some of you, um, 
your hearts are just destroyed. Um, and all the pretending just feels terrible. And you know, you know that Jesus is coming to you. If He stood in front of you this morning and looked you in the face that the situation and circumstance that you're working so hard to sidestep and so hard to pretend is not there, the doubt that you're facing, the disappointment that you're carrying, that you are working so hard to pretend is not there, Jesus looks you in the eyes and He says, Touch me. You think that that thing has somehow trumped my capacity to still be the answer. And I'm telling you, I'm here. So can we make this room our altar right now? Would you just meet with Jesus? Find some floor, find a seat. Get on your face before the Lord. And if you can look back and you can genuinely say, you know what? My faith is different right now. It's cold. It's indifferent. I'm not all in. Something happened. Things went off the rails and I just have not recovered. If that's where you're at, but you say, I, I don't care about what other people say. I need to know. I need to touch him today. If that's you, he says, come, put your hands on me. So would you do that? Just move out from where you're at. Hey, thanks again for watching the message from this weekend. Uh, if the Lord moved on your heart through what you heard, we want to encourage you to reach out. If we can pray for you, come alongside of you, partner with you in your faith, we would love to invite you to join with us. Uh, our email address is info at fountaincity.org. Please reach out if you have any questions or if we can pray with you and partner with what God's doing in your life. Thanks.